Video games have had us infiltrating Nazi bases for decades now, but Paradise Lost takes a decidedly more tempered approach than the all guns blazing action of Wolfenstein or Sniper Elite. Its underground bunker setting is almost completely desolate from the outset of the story, so the closest you'll ever come to having a rifle is when you are having a rifle through filing cabinets for clues to determine exactly what fate befell its inhabitants. Yet while I explored the often disturbing depths of Paradise Lost's subterranea with a sustained sense of morbid fascination, its frustratingly sparse approach to storytelling meant that my emotional investment in the plight of its characters remained permanently stranded on the surface. In Paradise Lost's alternate history setting, World War II continued through to 1960, allowing enough time for the Nazis to develop powerful atomic weapons in subterranean bunker facilities. Eventually, the Nazis unleashed a nuclear holocaust and retreated underground, reducing the entire European continent to an uninhabitable wasteland. Paradise Lost's story picks up 20 years later, when a 12-year-old Polish survivor named Shimon enters one of these bunkers in search of a mysterious man who knew his late mother and I felt an immediate pull to find out exactly who or what was lurking below. The eerie descent into Paradise Lost's cavernous expanse initially gives the impression that you're in for some kind of bunker-bound Bioshock, and this feeling is reinforced when Shimon soon strikes up a two-way radio relationship with Eva who plays an Atlas-style role in helping Shimon navigate through each area while keeping her true motivations unclear. What do you want? Who says I want anything? But there are no splices or big daddies to fight as you pick through the remains of Paradise Lost's deserted dystopia, and for the most part your actions are fairly basic and limited to reading letters, listening to audio logs and pulling levers to power up any dormant mechanisms that impede your path forward. Outside of your interactions with Eva, you are effectively left alone to try and piece together the narrative by scouring each office and hallway for as much information as you can. By far the most stimulating way to absorb a bit of the bunker's backstory is the handful of times you get access to an archaic EVE computer terminal, which provides you with black box style recordings of the last moments of activity in any given area. EVE is the AI that controls the bunker's security and agricultural systems, among other things, and it's oddly fascinating to watch a critical moment in this place's history unfold on the terminal screen in a flurry of human tracking heat maps and crisis management probability calculations. Curiously, these memory sequences are interactive, giving you control over where troops are deployed during a conflict between the Nazis and members of the Poland underground state, for example. These choices help to keep me engaged in the EVE interactions and they do have slight implications for Shimon's story. It's a memorial. They must have died in the battle I saw in that recording. But I could never really understand exactly how I was able to alter events that had already taken place. I guess I must have missed that memo. And believe me when I say I read absolutely every memo I could get my hands on. In fact, I sought out and pored over every scrap of information I could find in Paradise Lost, and yet I still don't feel like I ever knew enough about the individuals on either side of its central conflict to really care about its outcome. Paradise Lost is like a bag of Doritos. It looks dense from the outside, but once you actually open it up and reach around inside, it's surprising just how much of the space is unused. Although the environments are extremely well crafted, it's mostly all look but don't touch with very little available for up close examination. It's startling to come upon a hall full of creepy Nazi memorabilia and weapon prototypes, but somewhat disheartening to realize the only object you can interact with is this medallion and a book you can't read. I was also frustrated by Paradise Lost's tendency to deliberately prevent you from fully exploring its environments. Some of the larger areas have two separate paths you can take through them, but opting for one means permanently foregoing the other and any possible exposition it may be housing. If the sole point of your game is to tell a story, why intentionally cordon off chunks of it from the player? If it's purely a decision to encourage repeat playthroughs, then it's not one with much payoff. I played through Paradise Lost's four hour story a second time, choosing different paths and EVE choices the whole way through, and the outcome was only slightly altered and left me feeling equally indifferent. It certainly didn't help that the largely intermittent nature of Shimon and Eva's radio chats meant I never bought into their bond, which becomes the primary focus towards the story's climax. 
With their sparse conversations not providing enough substance to grab onto, it all seemed a bit forced, and their fates just didn't feel as important to me as Paradise Lost seemed to expect they would. I'm glad I found you. Oh. Paradise Lost fails to take full advantage of its gripping premise and the haunting atmosphere of its setting, falling short of the standard set by other first-person narrative experiences released in recent years. It's not as detail-rich as Gone Home, the radio-based relationship between its two leads never reaches the same level of intimacy as Firewatch, and its storytelling isn't nearly as inventive or interactive as that of what remains of Edith Finch. I admire the imagination that's gone into realizing the architecture of its underground facility, but I just wish the scarcity of story detail and character development within it hadn't left me feeling colder than a concrete corridor. For more IGN reviews, check out our verdicts on Loop Hero and Pixel Junk Raiders, and for everything else, stick with IGN.